Okay, everyone, and welcome to yet another uh, Friday afternoon research webinar uh, by Nora. Today, it's a pleasure to have Sintep here. Uh, Sintep is also a new member of Nora, so uh, I'm very happy, of course, to have you here to present uh, Greener Logistics with AI. And the presenters today uh, are Signe Rimer Sørensen. She's a researcher at Sintef Digital. Her expertise in, uh, is focused on the development of hybrid machine learning algorithms, combine, combining data-driven methods and domain knowledge for use in industrial settings, in particular within the domains of energy and construction and logistics. And the other speaker today is Camilla Stere. She's a researcher at Sintef Digital as well. She has a background in cybernetics and autonomous system theory. Her main focus areas are enhancing optimization algorithms using machine learning and applying machine learning in industrial settings, especially in the process industry. So it's a pleasure to have you here and both of you will uh, present. Uh, I believe Signe will start and for the audience, please, use the chat for chatting uh, and Q&A for questions to the speakers. And we will take the questions after they have finished. I think their presentation will last for about 30 minutes maybe, and then we will uh, go for a discussion and question. Thank you, Signe and uh, Camilla. The floor, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claes. And thanks for the invitation to present here today. And thank you to all of you for joining. So, greener logistics, that's all about exploiting the available resources to a maximum. So that might be stacking more goods onto your truck or making sure that the trucks aren't waiting in line. So these are traditional optimization problems, but as Camilla and I will explain today, we hope that machine learning also have a great role to play. I assume that most of you are familiar with Sintef, but as we are a new research partner in NOAA, which we're very happy to be, uh, I thought I would uh, explain a little bit about where we come from. Uh, so. We are an independent research institute. Most of what we do is applied research. It's funded by applications to the Research Council. Um, and often that is in uh, collaboration with the industry. But even though we are working with industry, we do also publish papers occasionally. Um, there are many groups in terms of that works with uh, application of AI in specific domains. Uh, but our group, uh, we, we work in the analytics and AI group. Uh, where the focus is the development of machine learning, uh, in particular for application in industrial settings, and the challenges we see when taking methods that are uh, potentially theoretically mature and trying to take them out to the, to the real world. Um, the group consists of 12 people, including researchers and PhD students, and we're located in Oslo, which is a surprise to, to many who think that Trondheim is, uh, is the center of center. Uh, we're part of the Department of Mathematics and Cybernetics, which is again part of Sense of Digital. Okay, so machine learning and optimization, they're tightly coupled areas, and there are multiple ways of combining machine learning and optimization. Um, we can start out with optimization in machine learning in order to find the best fitting parameters. Uh, there's optimization of machine learning, also known as hyperparameter tuning. Uh, then we can do optimization of machine learning based systems. Um, so optimization that's phrased as maximizing an objective under some given constraints. And those constraints, they're often dependent on a system. And sometimes they can be very hard to formulate in particular in real life. Um, so the idea here is that we can replace any analytic formulation of the constraints with a black box describing the system. Uh, and then the second half of the talk, uh, I will consider an example of how to achieve better coordination between trucks and dumbbells based on this idea. Um, then we can also do machine learning instead of op optimization. Uh, that's called reinforcement learning. And that turns out to be uh, very difficult to get that to work in real life because real life is complex. Uh, but we can also try to do machine learning in optimization, uh, where the idea is that we can use machine learning to speed up classical optimization algorithms, mostly with the focus of handling more uh, complex systems. Um, so today we will mainly consider number three of so optimization of machine learning based system and number five where we take uh, and make optimization algorithms better with learning uh, and we'll focus on two examples of industrial applications 
Uh, and as we shall see, there's sort of a gap between theory and practice. Uh, so the pro projects, they're very much um, characterized by research, even though the ideas are not that complex. Uh, first, Camilla, she will present a project called AI Stack, um, an attempt to combine optimization and learning to improve how to stack boxes and pallets. Uh, it's a very cool and very visual project. Um, and then I will present a project called Data Driven Sites, uh, where we work on reducing CO2 emission from road construction by improving coordination between excavators and dumbbells. And that's pretty cool because everyone likes big machines and we're doing it to reduce CO2 emission. Uh, and finally, we'll share some learnings that go across multiple projects. There you go, Camilla. Thank you, Sina. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a bit about the AI stack project, uh, which has been going on since the end of 2020 and will run throughout this year. Uh, as a researcher in Centef, you're not allowed really to have favorite projects, but this is mine because it is a lot of fun. Um, in this project, we work together with uh, Currents Robotics who have made this very, very cool stacking robot. So the robot drives around in a warehouse and it can pick up items from the shelves and put it down on a pallet. So uh, this is well and good, uh, but the robot also needs to know where it should put the items on the pallet for it to be efficient. If it's uh, allowed to, should be allowed to go loose in the warehouse at night and work by itself, it needs to know both how to pick up the boxes and place them, but also what order they should go in. So next slide, please, uh, Zina. So there are multiple reasons we would like to do this. Uh, one obvious one is that, of course, if the robot can pick up the boxes and decide where they go on the pallet, uh, you need less manual labor to do this for you. Uh, but as it turns out, it can also be a great source of reducing emissions. So uh, Currents is working together with uh, ASCO a lot for experimenting in warehouse. And ASCO have these huge warehouses all over Norway where they have uh, loads of mixed goods that they distribute to their customers. So they get orders from the customers saying that we need this much of this item and this much of another one. And they need to be packed together on the same pallet and distributed to the customer uh, in trucks. So every week ASCO is distributing about 100,000 pallets. Uh, and these 100,000 pallets go into 3,300 truckloads every week. And uh, by an estimate made uh, of Currents and ASCO, if we can make each pallet going out of the warehouse 5% more compact, that is to say we reduce the amount of air and uh, the volume of stack by 5%, we can save 200 truckloads every week going out of the warehouse. So that's that's kind of the overall goal here. Next slide, Signa. Okay, so I'm going to be, go slightly technical uh, just because this problem is so fun. Uh, so the problem we are trying to solve is quite well known, at least in some forms. It's called the distributor's pallet loading problem. And in the problem, you try to place boxes of different sizes and shapes onto a pallet such that the height is as low as possible, which is the same as saying that the capacity is as high as possible. So a lot of people have tried to solve this problem. Uh, it shows up in a lot of logistics. Um, we are looking at a slightly specific version where you have to keep the order of the boxes fixed because the robot is driving through the warehouse and we don't want it to have to go back and forth and back and forth. So we kind of, it's given by the position of the wares that we are distributing. And of course, this is going on in three dimensions. I am just very not skilled at drawing three dimensional things. So all the illustrations are in 2D. Next slide, Tina. Okay, so this is uh, a combinatorial optimization problem. It's a decision problem with a lot of dimensions. And humans are fairly good at solving these problems. Uh, just heuristically, we, we kind of understand how we can do this, ex especially if we build experience and become quite good at it. So efficient human stackers who have lots of experience working in warehouses can get these stacks to be maybe of 85% uh, capacity. And uh, when Current started out with this and wanted the robot to do the job, they tried out existing algorithms because people have been studying this problem for a long time, as I said. But 
they see that the existing methods were flattening out at maybe 75% capacity. So it's not really feasible to replace the human stackers with these algorithms. And this is also because the human stackers uh, are slightly more flexible than the robot. They can access the pallet from all sides. Um, they can stuff a box underneath another box, which are things that the robot cannot do. In addition to being hard to solve just to get the stack compact. We are also um, dependent on the stacks being stable because the robot is going to drive the pallet around in the warehouse and in the end is going to put it into a truck where it needs to stand. If it topples over, that's really bad, both for the goods, but it could also hurt people working in the warehouse. So if the stack is completely unstable, we can't use it. If it is uh, in kind of a dangerous area where it could topple over, we will have to wrap it in cling film, which we would really like to avoid, uh, obviously. So this is also a great challenge in this problem. Next slide. Okay, so when we started out, we saw that this looks exactly like Tetris in three dimensions with more shapes. So uh, we started looking at, okay, what have people done to uh, solve Tetris before? Uh, because as some of you may have seen, if you have uh, if you are slightly familiar with deep reinforcement learning, people have been using DRL to solve uh, all these uh, games, uh, very like simple computer games and harder computer games, but, uh, but still. So we found the solution uh, to how you could do Tetris with deep reinforcement learning. And we thought, okay, can we scale this up to solve uh, our stacking problem? So what we would like here is to just give a deep reinforcement learning agent uh, the order of the boxes that we want to stack, and we wanted to spit out the item position on the other uh, on the other side. As it turns out, this was not practically feasible, uh, considering that we do not have like Google level resources when it comes to GPUs and teams of researchers that can spend all their time uh, on optimizing reinforcement learning algorithm so that it uh, can work very well. Uh, we just had to uh, kind of leave this idea, even though it was very cool. So we took a step back and we said, okay, can we instead use something that already exists? There is a lot of knowledge on this problem already. Can we use this and then instead enhance it using learning? So this would be beneficial in several ways. First of all, we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We know the play rules of playing this. Uh, we know what is allowed and not allowed. We don't have to learn this all over. and Worst case, when we're done with the project, we are left with an algorithm that can at least find feasible solutions. So it might not be as good as we hoped, it might not be perfect, but we will have something that is working and can be uh, further developed. Next slide, Sina. Okay, so we went in for adjusting an existing solution. So we based this on uh, this paper that I've listed at the bottom. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, optimization and search, it's a beam search approach where we traverse a huge, huge search tree. Um, and we started out by saying that we can implement this and get a solution. And in the beginning, the, solution it found, the solutions it found were pretty poor. So then we went to the next step and said, uh, can we identify where it fails or where it gets very challenging for this algorithm to find good solutions? And then we tried to improve these uh, challenges uh, analytically. So we said, do we, can we pinpoint exactly what it is and just implement it without, without learning? And then in the end, we got to a point where, okay, we are not able to improve anymore using these uh, analytical approaches, at least we, we think so. But the algorithm is now uh, quite good. It creates reasonable stacks uh, and we actually have it operating in the warehouse. If you go to the next slide, uh, Zina. As here, uh, by now it's not working completely by itself, but it's uh, working under supervision and we're testing it. And most of the time it is working completely satisfactory. We get pretty good stacks, but sometimes, we need to spend a very long time uh, searching in this huge tree to find good solutions. So we could maybe find a very good solution if we let the algorithm run for two hours, which is just too long. Uh, and sometimes we struggle to analyze the stability of the stacks. As I said, we need to have stacks that can be moved around. So if you look at the image at the right here, 
uh, the current algorithm sometimes enjoys building these pillars, uh, which uh, are pretty compact, uh, to be fair. So it finds a compact solution, but when you start to drive around, there is a chance that these will topple over, which is not, uh, which is not what we want. So next. Yes, so this is when we think it is time to learn something. So we are currently looking at two things, uh, which is, can we tell when we have stacked maybe half the boxes if we are on a good way? Uh, is this a good uh, foundation for further stacking? Can we quantify how good a partial stack is? And the next one, can we tell if it is stable enough to be driven around without doing very complex simulations in um, in, uh, uh, in engines, uh, physical simulation engines. So if you click again, Sina, you can see that uh, the dream scenario is to build something like this. We put in uh, a partial stack and the next uh, boxes that we want to place. And on the other side, we magically uh, get out this factor, which tells, how, uh, tells us how good uh, this uh, current stack is. So far, we have started doing the learning. We have some uh, indications that we will be able to do this and actually be able to improve the algorithm. But sadly, we don't have any uh, results to show to you just yet. This is research after all, so it, uh, it takes time. But we really, really believe that this can be uh, a good solution. So uh, to summarize, we have a very complex uh, problem that we are unable to solve by learning uh, by itself. So instead of trying to learn everything, we take a step back, we use the existing knowledge, we use existing algorithms and identify smaller tasks that we can try to learn in order to improve and solve the problem. That's all I had to say. So Singna, word back to you. Thank you, Camilla. Um, I think that is such a cool project. I mean, who doesn't want to work with robots and save CO2 at the same time? Um, I'm going to tell about uh, the project Data Driven Sites. It's a 2 million euro project co-funded by Skanska Norway and the Research Council of Norway. The partners in the project they are, of course, Skanska and Simsef, uh, and a little software company called Dicho, uh, and then Volvo, who constructs machines. Um, the project runs for three years, and we're approximately halfway through now, so we're starting to see the first preliminary results. The construction sector accounts for approximately 15% of the Norwegian CO2 emission. Um, a fifth of this comes from the construction machines, so that's 1.6% of the total CO2 emission. That's pretty significant. Um, and of course, one approach for significant reduction uh, of the CO2 is just to replace all machines with their zero emission counterparts. For example, running on electricity or hydrogen. On a short time scale, that's just not realistic. It's not realistic because there's already a lot of machines out there um, working. They're in more or less perfect condition. Um, and no one wants to replace their machines when they're working. And it's not environmentally friendly to scrap machines that are working. Um, but there are things we can do here and now. Um, anyone who has seen a construction site, they may have noticed that the machines they're idling. They're dumbbells waiting in line to pick up material. They're the excavators waiting for the dumbbells to arrive. They're the roller dumbbells waiting for a new dump. Or simply, everyone might wait for the explosive teams to do their job. Skanska Norway, they have mapped that their machines, they're waiting between 40 and 60% of the time they're working on a project. Um, and reducing this waiting time, that will automatically reduce idling and thereby the CO2 emission. And I actually, I was so surprised by this number so that when we got access to these data, I had to double check. And they're right. The machines are idling between 40 and 60% of the time. The dumbbells are maybe on the better end. They, they might only be idling for 40% of the time, but still, it's a lot of idling. Uh, traditionally, dumbbells and excavators, they work in teams with a foreman that plan and lead the work. However, construction sites, they're growing bigger and bigger in size. And by now, a standard construction, road construction project is several tens of kilometers and of the order of 100 machines. And then even the most experienced foremen, they can lose overview. This is where data visualization comes in. And this is where Dicho comes in. They're a small company, uh, partly owned by Skanska, and they're specialized in collecting and visualizing data from construction sites. Um, 
And among other sources, they collect data from iPads or Android units, uh, and they visualize it live uh, on a website that looks like this. So you can see where the, the trucks they are driving around. Um, and of course, that's a help. And at least now the foreman, the poor foreman, they can see all their dumbbells at the same time. Um, it gives some overview, but it doesn't really highlight where the dumbbells are idling or whether they're just standing still because they're being loaded um, or close to where they are dumping. Um, and it definitely doesn't provide any uh, insights on the underlying reason. Uh, they also have visualization like this, where you can see all the historical tracks of where the dumbbells pick, picked up the mass and dumped it again. Um, but that's also just, you lose overview. So the aim of the project is to obtain a better coordination between the machines by developing an optimization model that can provide information on where any given dumper should go at any given time in order to reduce waiting time and idling time. The condition sites, the conditions on a construction site they are continuously changing uh, because they're constructing a rope, so they get further and further. Uh, and hence, the optimization constraints, they must be constantly updated. So the idea here is that we have a dynamic system that we want to represent using machine learning uh, and get a data-driven description of the site, and then use that as an input to the optimization algorithm. Uh, since the DTU platform is already used by Skanska in all of their projects, it's really cool that we can do very rapid implementation of the algorithms uh, during the project. And at the moment, we are live testing uh, a couple of uh, proof of concepts uh, on some pilot construction sites in southern Norway. Uh, I don't know if any of you are occasionally driving north out of Oslo. Uh, there's a lot of construction work. That's, uh, that's where we are testing. Um, so down the road, these algorithms, they will also uh, be available in the DJ platform. Uh, and hence they will be commercially accessible for any interested parties and you're probably mostly interested if you are dealing in the con road construction business. Um, the algorithm is independent of machine brand and fuel type or will be um, because we're doing this data collection mostly from iPad and communicating back to the drivers through an iPad. Uh, and you could think in the future that we can replace that iPad with uh, direct communication with the control system uh, in autonomous vehicles. Uh, so we're not trying to replace the control system in the autonomous vehicles. You will still need a control system that makes sure that they're not crashing into each other or that they know sort of how to drive. What we're, what we're really replacing is the manual planning of where they should drive on a um, self-updating uh, basis, taking all these uh, changes and condition into account. Our aim is a 10% reduction in idling time. And if that is used on all construction machines in Norway with the current uh, combination of machines, that would amount to a reduction of approximately 100,000 tons CO2 um, yearly. Uh, and it will also reduce fuel cost by five to 8% simply by reducing consumption. And as Skanska says, that's probably not something they're gonna get back. That's probably just something that's gonna make road building slightly cheaper or uh, the, yeah. So it goes back to community rather than um, rather than to Skanska. Uh, okay, I still haven't said anything about how we're actually going to do this. Um, we have we have uh, several components of the project. Uh, the first one is a dynamic mapping of the construction site uh, based on GPS data from the iPads and the dumbbells. Uh, the second component is machine learning based model to predict the fuel consumption and hence the CO2 emission but based on very local driving conditions. Um, and the third one is an optimization algorithm to guide the dumbbells and truck to where they're needed uh, to ensure this optimal flow on the construction site. Let's take a look at some of the preliminary results. Raw GPS points, they look uh, like a map when they're visualized, uh, but in order to be useful to the algorithms, we need to convert them uh, to graphs. Um, with notes at all the points where the dumbbells have to make decisions, such as picking up mass or dumping or making a turn. Um, I think maybe that, uh, yeah. Uh, the notes, they're connected by edges or should be connected by edges with information about the actual route between the decision points. And then you might say, I, why don't we just use existing maps? Well, we could use existing maps for some of the uh, notes, but 
we are talking about construction sites. The roads are not really the road they're constructing is on this map uh, as a prediction or a, a future uh, road. Uh, but all the construction roads they're changing continuously, um, and uh, yeah, they're adapted to the landscape and the conditions. Uh, so we really need something that's self-updating. Uh, and this conversion from GPS data to maps, it might look trivial, uh, but due to inherent uncertainty in the, in the data, uh, it makes a definition of, for instance, an intersection rather challenging. Also, as a, as a human, when I look at the data, sometimes it's hard for me to see with, if something is an, an intersection or if something is just one truck going in and, and another truck going in and they're going out, uh, but they never really crossed, or if there's an underlying. Uh, bridge like ropes into uh, levels that's also a challenge um so we've been looking a lot into what has already been done uh because of course people have worked on this uh, and it turns out people have worked a lot on this on um on roads so how to put traffic onto roads on your maps and also on defining where roads are in um city landscapes that are very American with very uh, regular roads uh, and regular intersections. Um, so we've had to implement a, a couple of uh, additional ideas also. Uh, and this is where currently prototyping uh, an algorithm for uh, automatic generating these graphs. Um, and in addition, um, and I'm going to explain in a moment how it works, uh, but in addition to being an important building block for the subsequent optimization, uh, when we when we told the the foreman and the and some of the drivers about this, they were just like, "Wow, we could actually get a map of our construction site." Because sometimes when they have to go somewhere, like one thing is when they're shuttling mass back and forth on the same route every day, it's okay. But if they have to go to the other end of the site and get something new, they actually don't know what the site looks like because it's changing all the day all the time. Um, so it, th there might be a, a pretty cool uh, side effect of this. Um, so what we do, here is that we know, we know where the load and the dump points they are, uh, or at least let's just pretend that we know where they are. Uh, so we then can use machine learning to obtain, obtain the points of all the intersections of the road. Uh, the first thing we do is a density-based clustering of all the starting points and all the endpoints of the tracks. So we have individual GPS tracks, and we know that each track is from when it's picked up mass to dump mass. Um, and of course, when it's driving back empty, that's also a track. Um, so based on these clusters, we select representative tracks uh, to cover all the load and dump points. Um, and yes, there might be dumbbells that have been driving around without ever loading or dumping anything. But they're not really interesting. Um, then we use the GPS tracks to determine where the dumbbells are changing direction. Uh, and this will, of course, identify a lot of places that are not intersections, uh, but simply might just be bends in the road. So they're what we call candidate intersections. And then we use a method from an algorithm called CellNet, uh, where we define an inner circle and an outer circle uh, around a candidate. So here you have the candidate in the center, and then an annulus around, and then we take all the um, GPS tracks and take all the, the pings from them uh, inside that annulus, and then we apply k-means clustering on the data points between those two radii, so in this annulus, and we do that for two clusters, three clusters, and four clusters. And then we have a, a score that we call a silhouette score, and we decide which of, uh, if the best clustering is two, three, or four clusters, um, which one is the most likely number that the data points they are split in. Um, and actually, we only care about one thing. We only care about whether there are two exits, then it's a bend in the road, or if there are more than two exits, then it's an intersection. So the reason why we do two, three, and four is that sometimes um, three, if there are four or five, exits, then uh, three is not necessarily a better clustering than two. But if we have more, it becomes better. Um, but we only care about the category, whether it's an intersection or not. Um, then if 
this method says that something is an intersection, we also check that the tracks actually go through both the center and the outer annulus. That is not someone who's just been driving in through the outer annulus and back out. Uh, so that I actually, it is actually a crossing. And then the last step uh, is to compute relevant information to store on the edges, such as distance, elevation differences, road width, um, and then store representative GPS track for visual visualization purposes. Um, then uh, another intermediate step before the optimization algorithm that is to be able to automatically detect suboptimal driving patterns. Uh, and with suboptimal driving patterns, we mean anything that can lead to non beneficial fuel consumption. That can be waiting time, that can be unnecessary acceleration or deceleration, or it can be driving too fast. Uh, and these days, one of our pilot construction sites, they're trialing a version, uh, a visualization in detail, which is the tool that they use all the time, um, of where the dumbbells or the trucks they're driving slowly but without being close to a, a, a digger. So they're not close to being loaded and they're not close to, uh, to dumping. This will indicate locations um, where the construction ropes, they're insufficient to handle the current traffic. That might be because they have too many dumbbells in the area, or it might be because they have too narrow roads, So it might be, and, and sometimes there's a natural explanation and they can't do anything about it. Uh, but at least now they, they get a sort of an, um, indication of where uh, things might not be optimal. Um, it's based on very simple and robust statistical algorithm, uh, and then just an intuitive visualization like in, in the figure here. Uh, and of course, we could also use a similar algorithm to detect acceleration and deceleration. Uh, and we did that, and that turned out to be exactly the same locations that would pop up. So uh, we only have to simplify things when we have one algorithm. Um, and we have also discussed whether we should use it to detect where they're driving fast. Um, because it would be a way of detecting it just on a statistical basis and uh, totally privacy preserving and just um, make it possible to implement safety measures. And the last result I want to show uh, relates to fuel consumption modeling. So here we see the, the GPS activity of a Volvo A45G uh, articulated dumper. Uh, that's one of the really big dumbbells um, during one hour of operations. Uh, so based on the GPS data here, we can compute the, um, the distance that it has traveled. Uh, and in addition, we have a really cool experimental setup uh, where we can measure the fuel consumption rate, um, fuel consumption on like few seconds resolution. Uh, that was uh, slightly hard to get. Um, and uh, at the moment, we have better data than Volvo have on their Domba. Um, and it's only because Volvo is in the project that we managed to do it at all. Uh, so in this plot here, uh, I show the distance traveled per 20 seconds in blue uh, and the fuel consumption in the same intervals in orange. There's a clear correlation between driving and uh, fuel consumption. Hooray! Now we have to take it that dumbbells are using fuel when driving. Um, that's fantastic. But we also notice that it's not, um, there's no clear correspondence between the activity uh, or the uh, distance and the, uh, and the fuel consumption. Uh, and that's not surprising. We expect many other factors to play a role. Acceleration will burn more fuel than simply driving on a road, or fully do loaded dumper will spend more fuel than an empty. Uphills, downhills, uh, local conditions, etc. So here we hope to do some supervised learning uh, on this very unique data set, uh, and that we can use that to learn something more about these complex relationships. And we will also be able to test this against the models that Volvo already have for their fuel consumption, which we are pretty sure are not precise enough to tell on uh, so short time scales what the, the fuel consumption will be. We also notice here that there's a non-zero um, fuel consumption level when they're idling. So when they're standing still, they're still burning fuel. Um, and uh, if we in integrate these curves, um, we can see that here, well, first of all, just defining standing still as being less than moving less than one meter per second in order to take um, the GPS noise into account. This number is standing still for 33 out of 60 minutes. Um, and we can integrate the curves to tell us that it has been driving a total distance of two and a half kilometers and it has burned approximately eight liters of diesel. That, that's all reasonable. Um, but 1.5 liter of diesel 
were used during the st standstill and the standing still half of the time. Uh, so this corresponds to almost four kilos of CO2, where we see that there's a huge potential for, uh, for reduction. So uh, now uh, Camilla and I have been talked about two very different examples of how we try to combine machine learning and optimization to achieve green logistics. Um, so here at the end, we would like to share some learnings that we've gathered across multiple projects, not just these two, but multiple projects in general. And um, the internet kindly provided this uh, figure uh, with Lego blocks showing exactly the points that we want to make. So from a modeling perspective, we can split the effort of, uh, of doing machine learning on, on data in, in, in two, uh, or obtaining green logistics in two. We can use machine learning descriptively to model various scenarios uh, and their impact on the climate. And that would correspond to the first four steps in this figure. That would be the data collection and structuring, and then we do some data science. Um, and that's very important in terms of providing policymakers with decision support. Uh, <laughs> with the caveat that it only will work if we can provide robust and trustable models. Um, but we can also use machine learning to actually reduce the impact and make logistics greener. Uh, so we can use it to identify areas of improvement uh, and then join with optimization. Uh, we can try to improve the efficiency. Um, however, our experience here is that that requires a, a, not, a, a very significant uh, input of domain knowledge. Um, to get the story or the meaning of the data. Uh, and then getting to the very last point that it only brings real value if it's implemented in daily use. So you really have to have the uh, problem owners involved in the development. Uh, and there are some challenges in order to get it to work. Uh, the first challenge is that we all interact with the AI on a daily basis, whether it's Google helping us navigating or Netflix suggesting a movie. So the expectations of what we can do uh, with industrial data, they're just huge. Uh, in most cases, the underlying industrial systems, they're very, very complex. Uh, and the data is not nowhere near what Google or Netflix they have. Uh, so we could say that it's crappy. Uh, and the consequences of doing something wrong, they're large. Uh, so we're working under slightly different conditions than uh, Google and Netflix. Um, but we still hope that the two examples that we've showed, uh, they illustrate that it's not, it's not impossible. Um, and they're characterized by very different challenges. In AI stack, the problem is very complex. Um, and it's actually the optimization algorithms that are really struggling. Whereas in data-driven sites, uh, it's a standard optimization algorithm, or almost standard. Um, but the constraints, they're continuously changing. So it's a very dynamic setting and we need to adapt the system description based on real world data with noises and with gaps and all the, the nasty things that comes with, the, with real data. But despite these challenges, we hope that we've shown that it's not futile to attempt to use machine learning in real life. And uh, greener logistics are often related to complex data-driven optimization problems, many of which we can only hope to solve if we can implement machine learning and domain knowledge. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for two really exciting talks or, and projects. Uh, I'm always so impressed and always like this, um, when you have like applied science or an applied project, which is also really at the same time, really fundamental. I mean, uh, mathematicians have been, thinking about uh, optimal packing for yeah for centuries and uh, and also the same i mean uh, signals project you i mean you have a kind of i guess uh, connotations to uh, traveling salesman problems and swarm intelligence and so on so i'm sure you could dig into this project for uh, the rest of your lives if you but but i guess uh, in an institute you need to also do kind of the work that you're supposed to do so maybe that's more a challenge to students and other ones here if you want to dig into these problems uh, at your spare time please do because these are interesting it's so nice to see also this project with um, uh, from uh, from camilla where you kind of have not only the applied project which has a lot of theory in uh, in its background but it's also involve constraints by physics you have this uh, that it should be stable for example mm -hmm. and, and even computer games you could uh, you could uh, certainly um, continue this uh, tetris uh, 
uh, way of thinking. I think that would be extremely nice to develop uh, uh, those tools, but that they also in the end have uh, have uh, results and uh, applied results that are important for the environment. I mean, um, so that's it's just so exciting project. I was a little bit excited here. I'm sorry for that. So I will uh, try to uh, take some questions. I have we have a couple of questions here. Um, first of all, from Kaspar, I will put on my glasses. Uh, Kaspar uh, Butker, uh, what was the main problems with using reinforcement learning? I think that was probably to Camilla. Uh, yes, that's a that's a very good question, and um, the main problem is just that uh, the dimensions are enormous. So it's actually uh, interesting to compare uh, this problem to uh, to chess, for instance. I've been looking at a lot of the uh, DeepMind's Alpha Zero algorithm, that's reinforcement learning for uh, doing chess, which is uh, widely celebrated. They spent years and years of both compute time and researcher time on making this work and be very well. Uh, but what we realized is that the search space that we are in is even bigger of that of test. It's, it's slightly different because you don't have uh, an opponent that can make unpredictable moves. You have full information, but uh, just the space that uh, of possibilities that you have to go through is absolutely, absolutely enormous. So in order to get models that would be good at predicting from all these available options, how well a specific placement of a box would be, uh, it would just have to be uh, very, very large and very data hungry, uh, which was, uh, so our main problem was uh, capacity. I have full belief that it could work if you put enough into it, but it's at some point, it's just not feasible uh, for a research project. Mm. Yes, exactly. As you say, Alpha Zero also use this Monte Carlo tree search combined with uh, building policy networks and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, the problem is very similar, but it's, as you say, probably even harder what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, could you have a defined kind of, uh, do you know, the, are the shapes of these boxes very ir irregular, irregular when it comes to, yeah. Yes, so that's the that's the answer, I guess. Mm. We have we have been in a meeting uh, which lasted for thirty minutes, just describing box shapes that could come uh, along <laughs> in the problem. So yes, there are there are lots of different boxes. And, and, that, and that, as I said, that was only when we considered the boxes. We haven't started considering like that they have to put bottles, etc., on the panels. Oh, exactly. <laughs> so yes, and, it's very complex. And different softness and uh, stability and uh, and so on. In addition, so oh, information mm. uh, properties, yes. Yeah, now I can see why this this is hard. Although still still very interesting. So uh, next question is from uh, Avin uh, Hetland. Uh, yeah, it's in Norwegian. I will try to translate. Uh, let's say thank you uh, for both of you for exciting uh, presentations. Uh, how could we, uh, if possible, follow the development of these projects? Uh, do you put anything on your web pages? I mean, maybe Evin is uh, interested in co in contributing to this very fundamental <laughs> uh, and very interesting. Uh, I would also actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, extremely interesting, kind of also from a theoretical perspective. This these problems. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, of course, if you're interested in uh, in contributing or collaborating on the on the problems, we are very keen on uh, on collaboration, and uh, probably the easiest way to do is. is um, um, co-supervision of, uh, of master students. Um, we're very happy to take in master students on uh, on projects like this. Mm, that would be uh, excellent. So uh, the other thing is, in terms of how to follow them, uh, of course, in the ideal world, we find the solution to all of the problems and we publish it. Uh, and you will be able to read papers that describe all the details of uh, of how it's done. Um, <laughs> in in the more practical world, since these are being industrial projects. Um, it's not everything that we are allowed to publish. Some of it we are allowed to publish, uh, mm. but uh, but yes, we hope that we will like, that we will be able to put out information uh, either publicly or at least on on websites uh, on how it's progressing. And of course, uh, we could come back in a year or two and uh, <laughs> explain how far we've gotten. Exactly, uh, that would be very interesting, and I'm sure if. Yeah, people, if you could write emails probably and ask if you want to yeah. uh, have no more. Uh, I guess also this uh, problem of optimal packing. I mean, uh, 
it's not even uh, possible, I guess, to solve theoretically. What's kind of the optimal pack- packing? I mean, it's not kind of a f- finite answer for that. I, I've I read about uh, also optimal packing of only of kind of this very simple object, for example, spherical uh, spheres. I mean, still, still there. You have a really hard uh, mathematics, and uh, it's really hard to solve this uh, optimal optimization mm. problems. And and speaking of uh, of um optimal uh, and master students we have a master student at currents who is working on formulating uh, like an analytical optimization model for this problem and uh, which is really helpful for us because it mm. gives us a lot of inspiration but it also uh, the more he does the more uh, we get proof that this is really really hard <laughs> yes exactly mm. Mm. But also uh, the solution to all this really, really hard problem is often machine learning when you have a lot of data and a lot of also difficulties because you could, of course, simulate and produce a lot of data, but then again, it's hard maybe to, um, to compute and, uh, and have the needed resources to solve it. Uh, and I guess next question is a little bit about this to Camilla. Uh, this seems like both a software and hardware problem. Two thoughts. Uh, how do you work in this intersection? Uh, I will also read the second one. Second, uh, Autostore received funding recently from SoftBank. Is there any way to combine their storage solution with your stacking approach? Just some quick thoughts from Alex Molso here. Hmm. Uh, so the, for the first question, at least, uh, we have uh, people in Synthef uh, Manufacturing who are working more on the hardware side of this through a different project. And of course, Currents is a big, uh, the people at Currents uh, are uh, like with ties to software and hardware together for our parts. So they will be interacting with the robot, working with the robot and giving us feedback to like, okay, we have uh, suggested uh, some prioritization uh, prioritization in the algorithm uh, and then they test it out and they say, you know, this is actually not possible because the robot works like this or saying that, okay, we have to change how the robot interacts with the uh, with the items. So uh, Singh and I are not uh, working that uh, tightly on the hardware, uh, sadly, but we have people working on that as well. And I think for the auto store, Singh, are you more familiar with this than, uh, than me? Um, not directly, but what I can say is that we, um, it has been discussed whether we should <laughs> increase the <laughs> problem complexity and also have a look at how the warehouse is laid out. As I say, we're not allowed to change the order of the boxes uh, in the orders, but what we could be allowed to do was to uh, refurbish the warehouse in a more um, convenient way. Uh, but at the moment, the algorithm is not, uh, we are nowhere near where we could say on a general level that we would have to um, uh, go a specific way around. Uh, and and for, the, for the first question, I actually think of, of uh, combining the hardware and the software. I think this is maybe also a lesson learned that they have started to build a robot with specific properties. And it is difficult to build um, something that, that can pick up boxes and put them down again. Uh, but they have started that construction without ever thinking about um, whether a different solution would have been easier. And probably something that would play Tetris and place the boxes from above without this arm would have uh, been easier algorithm- algorithmic to uh, to predict or to yes, yes. That's a very nice comment by Alex. You have to think outside the box. Um, <laughs> uh, very good, Alex. Thank you for that one. Um, um, I was also thinking when you're also starting to maybe remap the whole industry. Maybe these two projects have a kind of natural convergence in the end that you could <laughs> also move the robots and have some swarm intelligence and so on in a in this factory store. Uh, there is one more uh, question, I think, to Signa. Uh, using these increased compute resources will have an environmental impact. Have you found any way to calculate the overall impact constant digital operation will have uh, that is considering energy use, data centers, minerals, mined for maintaining hardware, etc.? Hard to consider a life cycle approach in the field of artificial intelligence in addition to this uh, reduction through optimization of green mobility within digital ecosystems. Yes, I agree. That's a, that's a very relevant issue. And the answer is no, we haven't found a way to, to quantify it. Um, sim- simply by looking, we, we're not dealing with 
particularly big data. Um, and we are not dealing with particularly heavy methods. At the moment, most of the analysis is run on, on a laptop. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that, of course, there's something, uh, there's some energy usage in terms of the servers that are handling the data, uh, but the analysis itself at the moment is not, uh, is not a major concern relative to um, something that's more than 1% of the complete Norwegian uh, CO2 budget. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I, I agree, and, and there's of course also an aspect that now all the machines are being equipped with iPads, uh, but the thing is that so far, the, the reason for putting in the iPads was actually different. The reason for putting in the iPads is that it's replacing uh, little yellow post-its that the drivers they used to write down now have been taking this many tons of uh, sand from A to B, and now I've been taking this many tons of rocks from B to A. And um, so the iPads are there for a different reason. It's just convenient that we can use them to, uh, to do live tracking with. Um, so, so how do they contribute into the uh calculation no the answer uh, the the honest answer is no we haven't found a way to quantify it yeah uh, and as you say um i i guess 15 percent of the total co2 emission is, is quite high so if you can do something about that but um, so the stupid question from me uh, is it possible to electrify these uh, trucks and uh, yeah. i mean um, yeah I so, mean, uh, as we said the algorithm is completely independent of the machine uh, of the machines, uh, so it will also be able to be used on electrical machines. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the whole idea is simply that we will use less resources if they are better coordinated. Mm -hmm. And that will apply regardless of, and it's also replying, reg applying regardless of whether they have drivers in them or are autonomous. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And if I understood you correctly, they, uh, they already know could they in, at least in principle get the map of, uh, and kind of roads or where to drive and so on. Do you? Do they have big uh, iPads or big uh, screens yeah. now in their trucks to see? Yeah, but they have iPads. They have iPads yeah. and all the screen and all the numbers, and we can visualize things back to the iPads. Um... That's excellent. Uh, more questions to Singnan Camilla. Have you gotten some input from the workers? I would assume uh, that the uh, construction site managers, foremen, are quite familiar with the bottlenecks and inefficiencies in the construction sites. Similarly, the packing workers might have some insights that could be put into the algorithms. From, from the data driven sites, uh, yes, we are uh, often in communication with both foremen and uh, drivers and uh, managers. And, um, and it was actually the foremen themselves that requested uh, a visualization of where they were driving slowly because they felt that they lost overview. So of course, they, they can a lot of the places they can tell in advance, but there will also be places where they can't tell in advance. And we're also at the moment working with other visualizations that they have asked for, uh, saying that can we have something that's easily showing us uh, which uh, dumbbells are uh, not driving efficiently and which ones are. And that's not to be able to uh, go personal on the drivers, but more to be able to say that on a team level, there's something that's not flowing. Maybe that's just one too many dumbbells, which leads to one of them always waiting or to all of them being inefficient. Um, so yes, we do get feedback. And then I think I will uh, let Camilla talk about the feedback uh, from the warehouse. Yeah. Um, so in the warehouse, we have a very experienced store. Uh, Osco has very experienced stackers who are uh, working. So when we started out with this, uh, we got some example stacks that they were made by the warehouse workers. As you know, this is, uh, they would stack something and say, this is an easy stack and we solved it this way. And uh, this is a very hard one. So therefore it's not as compact. So we have these examples uh, stacked by humans. And we have also done tests uh, along the way. Uh, where the people at Kearns have been going to the warehouse and just like studying people stacking boxes and saying like, okay, can you explain your thought process when you pick up this box and you put it in that corner and then you set that there and move it later? What is your, uh, what is your plan here? What information are you using? So we have, we have actually been using that quite a lot when, uh, when improving the algorithm like I, uh, I talked about earlier. Um, so yeah, we are, we are very much interested in what we can use of human knowledge uh, from before. That's uh, excellent. I think we don't have any more questions. If you have any more questions, you should be quick to write them down uh, right now. 
Uh, uh, you have seen this tendency also when you're talking about um, you were mentioning alpha alpha zero and I mean they started with with alpha go where you had a lot of prior information they were um, kind of using the um, top games from top players to to learn and so on so they it had the, and then it moved to more and more only self play and also the latest edition uh, I think it's called me me zero don't even have the rules uh, built in so so. Do you envision that, uh, I mean, when you have a smaller amount of data, you necessarily have to put some boundaries and, and prior knowledge into the system to, to be able to solve this. But, but in principle, would the most optimal way to solve it be, do you think, to, to, to simulate this as a Tetris game or, game or whatever, and then have a lot of data and you think kind of you could be able in principle to, to solve this uh, by, by deep reinforcement learning that way? Uh, I, yep. I very much yep. think it's at least uh, part of the solution. So uh, the learning uh, that I am looking into now uh, is uh, reminding us, would remind you a lot of uh, the way AlphaGo is set up. Uh, so it's based on this trying to use prior information, having all the rules available, um, looking at expert data, and then doing some self-play uh, to improve. And uh, I believe that is... Uh, the solution that could suit this problem uh, because we are we have to be able to run this in the warehouse on uh, reasonably normal uh, hardware that's not super expensive and um, don't not spend like years and years of GPU time training. Um, but the, I do believe that the solution could, uh, of course, you can't prove optimality uh, with reinforcement learning very often, but I do think that you could find very, very good solutions if this is done in the right way. Mm. Excellent. One last question. Uh, can the robot undo and know its actions uh, and just put the box aside for a moment? This is a strategy we are discussing every other week. Uh, it comes up and like, oh, you know, if it was just able to put this aside for later. So I think that will be... Uh, not something that we will uh, uh, that we will necessarily implement, but that the, the people at Currents will be implementing at some point because it is uh, it would be very beneficial. Hmm. Thank you very much. I will then just we should then just end the webinar. It is now three o'clock, and it was a truly inspiring uh, talk or two presentations. Uh, so I hope people can follow up and write your emails uh, if they have an, any further uh, questions. And so it's yeah. again so inspiring to see this applied, uh, applied and fundamental projects in kind of in one project or two projects. Mm -hmm. So Signe and Camilla, uh, thank you so much for the very nice and inspiring uh, presentations. Thank you so thank much you. for having us. Thank you.